thank you, and thanks everyone for coming. It's um, exciting that there are a lot of folks out there interested in subjective well-being. So since I'm presenting first, I'm gonna do a, a little bit of, of kind of laying the groundwork. Um, and so my, my first question is, you know, why study subjective well-being? And I would argue that one reason is that subjective well-being is an important lens through which we can understand the impacts of inequality on people's lives. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm using subjective well-being, here I'm meaning how people perceive their lives. And what I'm hoping to do in the next 20 minutes or so is answer two different puzzles. First, whether or not relative deprivation is a universally experienced phenomenon. Um, relative deprivation is the discontent people experience when their reference group uh, has more of something they believe that they're entitled to. And this definition comes, back, comes from Runciman back in 1966. Um, Secondly, I also look at which, if any, community attributes might matter for well-being. So the relative deprivation puzzle, which uh, Martin Revalian and, and others have, have looked at, is that there are consistent findings of relative deprivation oops, sorry, uh, from, from um, high-income countries. So there's an increase, and what that means is that an increase in reference group income is associated with decreased respondent subjective well-being. Basically, if people are doing better off than you, it makes you feel worse off. Um, and the reason why this might matter is that increasing disparities between people and their social comparators could leave people feeling worse off even if their incomes increase. So this is sort of a relative income potential um, issue. There's been a lot of work on this, um, starting with some sociologists in the 50s and you know, even, I would say, be before that, um, as I'll talk about briefly soon. Uh, an interesting twist is that while it's fairly consistent that relative deprivation exists, um, Feierbaum and Schroeder in 2009 noted that in America, relative deprivation appears to be spatially determined, so that it's better to live in a rich neighborhood within a poor country, or within a poor county, or within a poor region. And so what they're saying here is that, like, well, maybe what's going on with these wealthy neighborhoods is that it might be schooling quality that we're picking up on, or something that's some other attribute that makes people feel better about being in this, this particular reference group of, of, of a well-to-do neighborhood. And so I want to come back to this community service, or the, the access of, to community services um, shortly. Now, the relative deprivation puzzle, the piece that comes in is that there's mixed findings about relative deprivation from low and middle income countries. There's one study that absolutely finds relative deprivation in Nepal. There are a handful of other studies that don't find relative deprivation or, in fact, find a positive effect of having a wealthier comparator group. Um, and there's a lot of different explanations as to why this might be. One would be aspirations. So if I see people around me doing better off than, than myself, maybe I expect that I too, if I wait long enough, might also do well and therefore I'm not resentful of the people around me doing better off. Another might be mutual insurance. If I break a leg and my friends and family are, are relatively better off than I am, I can go to them for assistance. So they offer almost like a social protection mechanism that might not be available elsewhere. Um, there are other positive externalities that have also been hypothesized. Um, you know, a slightly darker interpretation might come from Durkheim, who says, well, maybe people don't aspire to what they don't expect to be able to achieve. So people maybe don't care, you know, I don't expect I'm ever going to do better. So the fact that everyone else around me is doing well doesn't really matter because I just, it, it's not going to influence my life. Um, now, one of the ways that relative, the relative deprivation is most commonly measured using some form of arithmetic mean. And when I was reading this literature, something that kind of came to my mind was, well, what if the underlying distribution matters? And what I mean by that is, say I earn $11 an hour, and the average in this room is $12 an hour, but this half of the room earns $10 an hour, and this half of the room earns you know, $13 an hour, that might be a different experience for me than if this half of the room earns $2 an hour and this half of the room earns $200 an hour. And so what I started to think about was, well, what is the, what, what does dispersion matter for relative deprivation? Um, so that's, that's the first piece I want to look at. The second piece I'm looking at is this community attributes puzzle where compared to kind of relative deprivation studies of which there are many, um, especially in, uh, in high income countries, there's much less research on how community attributes um, and the inequality of those attributes might, set, uh, might shape subjective well-being. And as we heard 
yesterday as well as elsewhere, as well as you know, kind of multiple times throughout the course of this conference, you know, communities are very different. And uh, uh, sort of, I think Lipton talking about urban bias in 1977 kind of really highlights this. And I think thinking about culture of poverty, neighborhood effects, you know, even for the financial of well-being, improving someone's self-reported health, like there's all these different ways in which communities can influence a variety of different outcomes. So I was quite curious as to try to identify which community characteristics and does dispersion of those community characteristics matter for subjective well-being in low-income countries. Um, to highlight or to kind of preview my findings, for 10 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, I don't find any evidence of mean-based relative deprivation. And I'll talk a little bit as to why I think that is the case. Um, and this is quite similar to um, other studies of low-income countries. However, I do find something that I'm terming inequality-based relative deprivation. And what I find is that when there is more inequality, a higher Gini coefficient, a marginal increase in the consumption wealth index has a greater impact on subjective well-being. So basically, when you live someplace with a lot of inequality, a marginal increase in, my, in your economic well-being kind of amplifies it, the, or the, the, it, there's an amplification of the of an increase in the economic well-being on one's well, on one's subjective well-being. Uh, I also find that crime and the perception of government capacity both matter for subjective well-being, although the self-reported access to, or sorry, although the reported access to community services doesn't matter. Um, and similarly, the sort of the degree of, of inequality of crime within your community matters in the opposite direction as you might expect. So as crime becomes more and more unequal, you feel better off, perhaps because you have a less of a chance of experiencing crime. So what I do is I match data sets for 10 different countries. I use the Afrobarometer round four from 2008, and I match it with demographic and health surveys um, from round five. I use also some UN, U wider measure, uh, Gini measures and the World Bank GDP average. Um, and those are the 10 countries there. So the subjective well-being question comes from the Afrobarometer survey, and it asks people to describe their living conditions compared to others living in this country. Um, this is, so my total sample is about 13,800 people. Um, and as you can see here, there's sort of a normal distribution of, of responses. Um, you know, most people are kind of clustering around, you know, relative to other citizens. I'm doing a little bit better, a little bit worse, or about the same. Um, I think as, as some of the other speakers will talk about, there are lots of factors associated with subjective well-being. And what I'm going to do here today is really just try to focus on these community factors and on inequality measures. Um, I think there's a fair amount of research from psychologists saying genetics matter a lot. Getting good genetic data is extremely difficult, so we have to put it aside. Um, now, one of the limitations of the Afrobarometer data is that there is a lack of either a complete asset expenditure or income module. And so Afrobarometer is, is quite interesting because it's a lot of breadth, but there's not very much depth to the data set. Uh, so as a result, I use a principal components analysis to compute a consumption wealth measure. And this might be controversial, but what I do is I combine both consumption measures and asset measures. And the reason why I do this is I'm quite concerned that using one or the other would leave out a tail of the, of the kind of economic distribution. So for example, Afrobarometer includes asset information about you know, how, do you own a radio, do you own a car, do you own a TV, et cetera. And it's quite possible for someone who is poor to answer no to all of those questions. It's also possible for someone who's ultra poor to answer no to those questions. And I wouldn't be able to differentiate between those who are sort of right at the poverty line and those who are extremely poor. So asset-based measures leave out, I think, the, the kind of the left-hand tail a little bit too much. And meanwhile, the consumption measures from Afrobarometer kind of clump up the right-hand tail too much, where it's quite possible for someone to say, I never go without food, I never go without water, I never go without fuel which are the questions about consumption that get asked. However, um, it's, you know, it's quite possible that middle class and, and high end, you know, and, and high income folks would answer yes, you know, this never happens to me all the time and I wouldn't be able to differentiate between them without including the asset measure. So that's why I'm, I'm doing both. Um, it's a little unorthodox, but I think it works actually quite well. So what I have here is 
the mean consumption wealth score uh, on the x-axis and the mean subjective well-being score on the, on the y-axis for urban and rural um, groups within, within my 10 countries. So I've got 20 data points. And you can kind of imagine a line running all the way up through here. There are a couple of, of kind of exceptions, and I think they're, they're pretty understandable, or at least I feel like there's a good reason why this might be the case. The first exception is that urban and rural Kenya are kind of fairly well below um, where, when, where, in terms of well-being, where you think they might be based on their consumption wealth scores. This survey was fielded in 2008, after the 2007-2008 post-election violence in Kenya, so I would suspect um, that people were, were really kind of recovering from or quite concerned about what had recently happened in Kenya as they were answering their subjective well-being questions. Um, relatedly, urban and rural Liberia are sort of much higher than one might expect um, given their, sub their consumption wealth scores. I think it's quite possible that that their experience, that their sort of the memory of the Civil War maybe made people feel like, you know what, I'm doing pretty okay actually. Um, another interesting piece is that a lot of, is that the vast majority of kind of the, of urban, of urban um, respondents claim higher subjective well being than rural respondents. Uh, although this particular facet goes away when I control for, or when I start including variables around crime. Um, and perception of governance and so on. So what I do is I estimate a series of logit model, ordinal logits, um, the subjective well-being variables, five categories, so I use an ordinal to address that. I have three different measures I'm going to show you, or three different models I'm going to show you quickly today. The first looks at community attributes, and the community attributes I include is crime, risk, and experience with crime, perceptions of governance, and access to community services. All three of these are also indices computed using principal components analysis. I should note that um, the access to community services is, is not, in fact, self-reported. That earlier slide was a mistake. I apologize. It's a numerator report. So an enumerator comes into a community and says, you know, yes, this household has access to water, this household has access to electricity, and so on. And I think there's a lot to be said that they might be wrong. Um, Secondly, the second set of, of findings I'm going to show are standard measures of relative deprivation. This is mean-based relative deprivation. And I'm computing reference groups based on urban or rural residency status within a country. This is a, an extremely broad definition of a reference group. And I think that this is partially why I don't find any evidence of relative deprivation. Um, given sort of data limitations, this is kind of the, the finest grain cut I think I can get at the moment. But, um, but what I do find, <laughs> is that I exchange these mean relative deprivation measures for measures of inequality within a reference group computed as a Gini coefficient. And then I interact that Gini with the respondent's own kind of index score in order to get a sense of um, where they stand relative to, to others. So there are a lot of variables that are suppressed here. But what I want to point out is, uh, first is that this consumption wealth score is highly statistically significant at the 1% level, and it's also positively related to subjective well-being, as we would hope. Um, the perception of government uh, index, which, which asks people how well do you think the government is dealing with food insecurity, how well do you think they're dealing with crime, with health, et cetera, basic um, human development sort of um, factors, and that's also strongly correlated, and so I think this is a potentially quite interesting finding where if people feel positively about what their government is doing, they're also more likely to feel positively about their lives. Um, I don't know what direction that is happening, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting finding. Um, I also, the experience and fear of crime index is, is also quite statistically significant, and it's negative. So as your, as your fear of crime increases, your subjective well-being declines. I also looked at a variety of different health measures. Here is looking at wasting rates within a community. It turns out none of these are particularly significant or interesting, but I had this vision that they were going to be an important aspect of what people's lives, what might be contributing to people's lives um, was sort of a, a, a general sense of, of how healthy their community was, but it doesn't look like that. Thank you. So in the second set of findings, I look at, um, 
I'm, again, I'm suppressing, I'm suppressing a fair number of things and just including a handful of things. I'm looking at relative deprivation. Um, the, you know, the access to community services measure is not significant, so I've, I've kind of put that aside. Um, but what I find here is neither leave out mean consumption wealth index or my leave out mean crime and fear of crime index are statistically significant. So I don't find any evidence of relative deprivation as constructed with my extremely broad reference groups. So what I do instead is start looking at inequality. And I compute Gini coefficients and interact those genies with uh, each individual's own consumption wealth index measure as well as their own um, experience and fear of crime index measure. And what I find is I do find that they are statistically significant. I'm gonna go straight to the marginal effects because it's hard to interpret them without, um, you know, when we have an interaction term, we can't interpret them unless we're looking at, at the marginal effects pieces. Um, so, what, we find, what I find here is that the marginal effect for a consumption wealth index evaluated at different values of the consumption wealth genie matters a lot. Um, so here's my reference group. Um, here, so these are all statistically significant. I didn't put the stars in because it made my tables ugly. Um, so here's the, the Gini coefficient for urban Benin, which is relatively low, and the Gini coefficient for rural Benin, which is relatively high in my, you know, across my 20 reference groups. And what I'm finding is that places with higher inequality, um, a marginal increase in the consumption wealth index has a higher proportional odds of, of changing someone into the next higher level category of subjective well-being. Um, so what I'm finding is that inequality amplifies the impact of an increase in um, the consumption wealth index. Oh, and so I guess I should remark back here. Interestingly, the obverse is not the case. There is no statistical significance associated with an increase in, in the Gini coefficient for different levels of the consumption wealth value. So for the marginal effects piece on, um, for crime risk, what, here I find a, a slightly higher increase in the crime risk Gini um, dramatically increases someone's proportional odds of reporting a higher value of subjective well-being. And so the idea of a crime genie, to kind of reiterate, is that as crime becomes more unequal, as it becomes less likely for you yourself to experience crime, you feel better off. Um, and in fact, this, this effect is even larger than the consumption wealth index effect, which I think is also quite interesting. So to summarize, you know, Durkheim wrote um, in Suicide in 1897 that desires depend upon resources to some extent, and I find that desires also depend on how, both how equitably these resources are distributed, as well as, you know, the particular resources we're looking at matter quite a bit. Um, so I find that crime and crime inequality matter, as does the perception of governance. Relative deprivation in this sample is an inequality-based phenomenon, and what I'm finding is that inequality amplifies the impact of economic factors on people's perceptions of their lives. I also find that relying on mean measures of relative deprivation rather than distributions might explain some of the lack of findings of relative deprivation in other places, and might miss some of the important ways in which inequality uh, shapes subjective well-being. I should also comment that I have another paper in process that looks at different sorts of, rel of reference groups. And there I do find that the, the type of reference group matters quite a bit. So looking at a village level reference group, I find relative deprivation in Ghana quite strongly. When I look at social networks within those villages, especially reciprocity based social networks, I find it actually um, a positive impact. So it's much better to have a, your social network do well, whereas you might feel quite, quite badly if you're um, if your community is doing much better than you. And so this is, I think, consistent with Revalian and Lokshin's work as well as with, um, I believe, Kingdon and Knight's work. Uh, and so I think the fact that I don't find relative deprivation here, to me, indicates that the reference groups are, are probably overly broad. However, I do think that the inequality piece is, is still quite interesting. So thank you.